Come on, new life, give God praise in this space. Come on, new life, give God praise. If you know you're safe, if you know you're safe. Come on, if you know you're safe. Hallelujah. We give reverence to God and to his wonderful son, Jesus, who is the Christ, and certainly to the power and personality of the Holy Spirit of God. Join me, and once again, I know you have applauded and appreciated all month long, but join me in celebrating your bishop. Amen. Dr. Kevin B. Willis and Pastor Linda, Dr. Linda Willis. Come on, thank God for them again. I don't know about you, but I don't believe we can ever do too much for the man and woman of God. Uh, they have certainly been a blessing to my life, our lives, my family, and I are blessed with friendship for nearly two decades now, and we are grateful to God, what God has, uh, has done, uh, and I am so uh, thankful to the Lord for the gift um, of the Willises in my life, amen. Not only them, but their adult children, amen, their adult children, uh, KJ and Kelly, we thank God, Harper, we praise God. Mom Willis, we praise God for you. As a family, you mean so much to us. Priscilla sends her love today. Um, it's Women's Day back home, and she's over the women's ministry, but she sends her love. Uh, Patrick and Maya as well. We're grateful to God for friendship and fellowship across these years. It's been an amazing journey to do life and ministry with people you love. Um, as Pastor alluded to at the early crowd, um, this morning, we both were at the same conference on last week. I was so proud of your pastor and first lady, amen, um, for um, just the tremendous story that they told to the nation, their story, in a very transparent way, and to challenge us and to inspire us at last year's conference. Um, it's something else when you see folk you know and love on the platform. And you get an opportunity to witness what God is doing and for others across the country to hear what you've been a party and a witness to. Amen. Amen. And I was so blessed of God. Um, but, but on this year's story time, um, there were preachers that were talking about how difficult and how challenging it is to be in ministry, how lonely it can be, and how uh, preachers can betray other preachers. Amen. Ministry gets lonely at times but I'm thankful that God has blessed my life and and uh, not just bless me but bless my wife and our children with people who genuinely love us genuinely concerned about us and we're genuinely concerned about them and their family and we're grateful to God because you only get a few friends in this life I wish I had a witness here so you only get a few friends and I'm thankful to the Lord for, for them. And what an honor it is for me to come and share uh, on another Founders Day. I always just stand in awe and amazement of what God has done in the life of this man and this woman of God. Their family and you, the New Life family. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have you been blessed in this worship experience? Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me, get, uh, let me get right to the text. Um, Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32 is where our text finds its resident. I asked them at breakfast, I said, y'all sure y'all need to have another service? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I just was checking. Amen. <laughs> they assured me that they needed to have another service. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 32. Blessed by this amazing psalmist today, Lady Jones. God bless you. Thank God for you. You have blessed my soul. Awesome music and worship ministry team here. These anointed musicians and these psalmists. Amen. God bless you. Thank God for you. Psalm 32, verse number 17. I think the NIV translates this passage on this one. Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and by your outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. Right. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Right. I want to tag this text, the God that can. Right. 
the God that can. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you still use and choose to use the foolishness of preaching to draw men's hearts to repentance. It is our prayer, dear Master, that you use these moments for your glory and for your honor, that the body of Christ will be edified in the name of God, glorified. I pray, God, now that you'll stand in my body, think with my mind and speak with my lips, and let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you're my strength, and I am grateful that I've been redeemed by you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and give you praise. Amen. Amen. I believe God. All right. Let me say that one more time. I believe God. I believe God. I think, I'm, I, think I, I need to qualify that because I believe in the God of the Bible. I am unashamedly to say that I believe he is the only God worthy of believing in. And in a very real sense, this is the larger message of this passage. Though the vast majority of us would say we believe in God, I wonder how many really do believe God. Because there is a difference between believing in God <laughs> and believing God. <laughs> I know it seems like it's a play on words. <laughs> But there really is a difference between those who claim to believe in God and those who believe God. Maybe, maybe that's what is at the core of societal ills. Everybody that's claiming to believe in God doesn't really believe God. God God is. Oh, yes, he is. God, God, God is. I know somebody's saying, well, Reverend, that seems like that's an incomplete sentence. No, it's not. God is. Subject and verb connect. God is. If you need more to it, just add whatever you want to. <laughs> Somebody over here, you need to put healer right there. God is. Somebody back there need to put God is deliverer. Who back here? God is a provider. Anybody can insert God is a way maker. God is, God is, God is, God, God is, God is, God is. God is. To say I believe God is suggests that it is more than just a cognitive knowledge of the existence of God but rather it's an existential nature of all that God is. And you can come and make that declaration without any reservation that if God is, then it suggests that God can. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I said if you really believe that God is, then you ought to come to the conclusion that God can. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Because God is, God can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They teach you in school, you ought to have, you ought to have a thematic thrust to every message. You ought to have a, 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 a thematic statement, a thesis statement. And I tried to make one real pretty and fancy because I'm coming and preaching to two doctors. But all I could come up with is God is. God in heaven. And because God is, God can. In fact, to erase one would be to eliminate the other. I do not know for sure, but I suspect God would prefer we not believe in him at all than to believe he is anything less than he is. And I don't know for sure, but I suspect that God would prefer for us even not to believe him at all if we're going to believe that he is and don't believe that he can. Today we consider Jeremiah 32. Jerusalem is 
under siege by the Babylonians. God warned Israel he would take them into captivity and shut the nations down if they did not obey him. They did not, so he is now keeping his word. God has told Jeremiah that this is about to happen, but then he tells Jeremiah to go and buy a field and take a title deed to it. Jeremiah rightly wonders why God would tell him to buy a field when he and his people are about to be taken away into captivity. It just doesn't seem to make sense. In fact, it seemingly is a huge waste of resources and money because he will never see that land again. Then God asked Jeremiah this question. Am I the Lord, the God of all mankind? Is anything too hard for me? Verse number 27 is right there in your Bibles if you ain't take it out. Interestingly, this question was not asked of God. It was not asked about God. It was not asked to God, but it was asked by God. It, it, it's, it's, it's what we would know as a rhetorical question because Jeremiah earlier had already answered his own question. Earlier in verse 17, it, it says, uh, uh, Our sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Isn't it interesting how God has an unusual way of turning the table? God has a way of flipping the script, P -p putting, put, put, putting what you say really to the test. Jeremiah has made this declaration, and now God puts his own words. Y'all looking at me in that tone of voice. How many times have you said something about God? How many times with your own mouth you testified about God and then God allows you to be put in a situation that now your words are put to the test as it relates to your own faith in God. You better say something in this part of the message. How many times you run around here talking about a healer and you ain't never been sick? But then God allows sickness to knock on your door. How many times have you talked about God being a comforter? And it's not until you got to stand at the graveside of your own loved one. How many times have God allowed your life circumstance to put be put to the test? Based upon what you have confessed concerning him. There, there's, there's nothing too, too difficult for the God of the Bible. He, Je Jeremiah reminds us that he is, he is the God that can. This text is uniquely tell, teach us three timeless truths. <laughs> Have you ever noticed it's always three? It's always three. He, 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 here it is, here it is, here it is. Here it is. This, he, he, you can face anything life throws at you and be victorious if you can grasp these truths. The first thing I want to tell you, I promise, I promise, I ain't going to hold you long. Let me give you these, and I promise we'll be on our way. First of all, the promises of God are sure. <laughs> I know you want something deep and fancy, but that's all I got. The promises of God are, are, are sure. Jer Jeremiah refers to a promise God made centuries before, right out the gate. Jeremiah 32, verse 21 and 22, if you still got your Bibles open. You brought your people, Israel, out of Egypt with signs and wonders. By mighty hand and outstretched arm and with great terror, you gave them this land. You had sworn to give their ancestors a land flowing with milk and honey. Here it is. This word sworn grabs my attention. In fact, I think it's pivotal to the entire passage. He says, literally, it means to take a sacred oath. It means when you make a promise. Here it is. Here it is. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You know what a promissory note is, don't you? 
Oh, if you buy anything of any real value, you've got to sign a promissory note. The promissory note tells the person who is providing the financing in most cases that you will promise to pay it back. And then, hello somebody, the deal is not sealed until your name goes on the line. Here it is, that promissory note contains your name and by the authority of your credit in most cases, it's the worth and value of your keeping the promise. Come here, child of God. I want to serve notice to you that God in his word has given us over 7,000 promises and with every one of those promises, it's just like having a promissory note from God. He has signed it and his credit is on the line. I don't know about you. But I have 100% confidence that God has either kept, is keeping, or will keep every promise he's made in my life. I'm going to say that one more time. I have 100% confidence that God has kept, is keeping, or will keep every promise he has declared over my life. You you, you don't have to worry about God being able or, or even unwilling to keep his promise. Because God himself said to the prophet Balak way long time ago over in Numbers chapter 23 that God is not a man (laughs) that he should lie. He ain't even the son of man that he might change his mind. I wish I had a witness here. He, He does not speak and then does not act. He does not promise and does not fulfill. God is not going to renege on any promise on your life. God doesn't change his mind. He says what he means and means what he says. When he says he'll do something, he will do it. And he'll do it every single time. There are going to be times when you find yourself in the middle of a dark storm. You find yourself in the middle of a situation. In fact, the stormy seas seem as if they are drowning you. Seas of trouble are overtaking you. You're, you're, you're going to be times when you're facing mountains that seem to be insurmountable. So big that you can't even go over them. But at that moment, let me just tell you, my brother or my sister, you can remember two things. One, God has already promised he will fulfill his plan for your life. God will achieve his purpose for you and God will work everything out for your good. God always and finally God always keeps his promise. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that whatever I face in life, God has already promised me that is working together for my good. God has already said I keep my promise. So why in the world are you tossing and turning and not going to sleep at night? Why are you living your life in fear? God has already declared that he will take you into your purpose. He will fulfill his plan for your life. The promises of God are sure. But not only are the promises of God sure, the prayers to God are heard. (laughs) Y'all making me work too hard. I said the prayers of God the prayers to God are heard. It's right here in verse 21. You brought your people Israel out of Egypt with signs and wonders by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. Oh, we love the story of the Exodus, how God brought the nation of Israel out of bondage from Egyptian captivity into the land of promise. We, as people of African descent, love the story because it's so similar to our pilgrimage. Uh, But have you ever thought about why God did that? Have you ever given in consideration because because he had been, it was was simply, why did he do it? Why why would God God do that for them? Let me give you, let me give you, let me give you a simple answer. It is because they asked him to. (laughs) You missed it. You missed it. I've been to seminary, been to Bible college, working my little demon too. And I understood. I tried to do all the research, all the language, and I figured it out. The reason God did it for them is because they asked him to. (laughs) You, you, You do know that their deliverance is a direct answer to their prayer. See, 800 years before Jeremiah wrote these words, Israel was a bunch of beat down slaves. 
totally dominated by the nation of Israel with, with Egypt with no weapons, no resources, no leader, no resources, money, no resources of, of, of uh, uh, mere time. It looked as if there was no way out. The door had been locked and the key had been thrown away, but they prayed. Help me in here today. God, God, the Exodus 2 and 23 and 25 says, during that long period, the great king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked down on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Come here, child of God. Why did God raise up Moses? Because they prayed. Why did God part the Red Sea? Because they prayed. Why did God slay the Egyptians? Because they prayed. Why did God deliver Israel? Because they prayed. Because the prayers of his people. I wish I had one witness. Just like God kept his promise to them, God will keep his promise to you. What have you asked God for? May, 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 maybe the reason you don't see the hand of God moving in your life, maybe the reason you don't see the deliverance that's being wrought in the lives of others. Maybe you're looking on bishop and pastor with eyes of envy at how God is blessing them and working and moving in their lives. Maybe, maybe you just hasn't asked God to do anything. Uh, here it is. Anything that falls in line with the will of God is a done deal. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter how big the request is. It doesn't matter how difficult it may seem for God to answer the prayer. The reality is God can and he will, but you got to pray. Uh, listen, I found out recently when you go back and study the miracles of the Bible, both in the Old and New Testament, almost every miracle has done as a direct answer to prayer. You want God to move. You want God to work it out. You want God, amen, open doors. You want God to move in circumstances. If we would ever begin to believe in the real power of prayer, we would begin to understand the greatest power on earth is not financial power. The greatest power on earth is not political power. It is not atomic nuclear. It is prayer power. Prayer can do anything that God can do. And because God can do anything when you pray and any prayer that is in accordance to the will of God, God will answer it. It makes prayer the greatest power. I don't know about you, but I still believe the Bible. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land is there anybody in here still believe in prayer I came in here this morning on prayer I wish I had one witness I flew in here yesterday on prayer slept last night on prayer watch God watch over my children because of prayer took care of my family because of prayer is there anybody in the room still believe in the power of prayer God help your servant did you get that first one the promises of God are sure the prayers to God are heard let me give you this last one and I promise I'm done. I'm going home, Lord. Y'all work me hard today. Here it is. The problems of life can be solved. I know you wanted something deep. I know you wanted something climactic, but that's all I got for you. The problems of life can be solved. Not only is God a prayer answering God. God's all powerful God. I'm omnipotent. He can do anything. But I want you to remember this as well. He's also omniscient. And he knows everything. Verse 19, I'm still in the text. Great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes, Lord Hammer said, are open to the ways of all mankind. You reward each person according to their conduct and as their deeds deserve. That's a scary verse. I said, that's a scary verse. I get shock and awe when I read that verse. Because here it is, God is an all-knowing God. He knows everything. And the text suggests to us that God never misses anything. 
God sees all things, he hears all things, knows all things. If God knows everything and God can do anything, then it stands the reason that there's no problem too hard that God cannot solve. Mm. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why this is such a big deal to me. And it ought to be a big deal to you. Let me give you these two reasons. First of all, we all got problems. <laughs> I said, we all got problems. See, you got problems, I got problems, all God's children got problems. In fact, let me just say this, in my Pastor Linda voice, if you don't think you got any problem, that's your biggest problem. That, 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 that's your biggest problem if you think you don't have any problems. Let me tell you something. We all have problems. But secondly, we all have problems that only God can solve. <laughs> now listen, I'll be honest. There are some problems in my life I can handle. I, listen, I know you don't want, I know you want, but I'll just admit there are some problems in my life. In fact, I don't even want God to take care of them. I'd rather take care of them problems myself. Y'all, come on, help me out here. Some stuff I don't even worry God about. Y'all tell you, listen, I know you take everything to the Lord in prayer, but there's some stuff I can handle on my own. I'm just going to be honest with you. You may not like that, but let me just tell you this. Let me just tell you this. There are some problems in my life, and God has strategically, strategically set me up and put me in positions that they are too hard for me to handle. Yeah. In fact, that's the reason I make the declaration that I make right now that God can is because God over and over again. In fact, there are some problems I thought I could handle and when I started handling them, I made them worse. And then they got so big that God had to handle them. God, I feel like preaching. Is there anybody in here? I don't know what your problem is. Is it money? God got a cattle on Thousand Hills. Come on here, somebody. Is it, is it a marital problem? God performed the first wedding in history and saved that marriage. I know he can save yours. Is it a moral problem? God can heal your heart. I don't care what problem you have. God can handle it. In fact, Greatest problem the human race has ever had is our sin problem. Come on here, somebody. And let me put it this way. The biggest problem that we ever will face is our sin problem. Oh, but thanks be to God that God sent his son, Jesus Christ. I know you know the story. How he came down through 40 and two generations. I wish I had one witness. Born in a manger in Bethlehem of Judea wrapped up in swaddling clothes i wish i had just one witness here and how he lived an immaculate life how he died at every eye cross every day he who knew no sin became sin for us and he died one friday didn't he die I said he died one friday after they hung him on a high and stretched him wide he died on that friday but early sunday morning Y'all better go back to your Baptist roots. I know you're charismatic, got charismatic tendencies now. Yeah, neo-charismatic as they call it. But somebody ought to go back to their Baptist roots early. I said early. One Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands. And because he conquered our sin problem, that means he can handle any problem. I'm so glad that God I serve can handle any problem because I found him to be a way maker. Found him to be a heart fixer, a mind regulator. I found him to be a burden bearer and a heavy load sharer. Is there anybody in the room that can testify with me that God can? I dare you how find somebody and tell them that God can that means whatever the problem God can solve them I hear the songwriter of old saying we don't sing it anymore this and that I put it all in his hand I don't care what the problem God can solve them say yes say yeah 
Is there anybody in this space know that you serve the God that can? Is there anybody here that know you trust the God that can? Y'all come on, let's get out of here. I'm glad that the God I serve can do anything. You name it, God can handle it. I don't know about you, but I'm glad. That's the reason we said in old church, be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings, a love abide. God will take care of you. Is there anybody here? They say he made a way. God can open a door. God can move mountain. God can tunnel through river. God can say yes say yeah God can I know he can if you know he can you ought to give him praise right here if you know he can get your child to get your child through college you ought to give him a praise if you know he'll pay your bills if you know he'll heal your body if you know that you know that you know that you know that you know you ought to say yes say yes say yes Say yes! God can. The God that can. To say I believe in the existence of God, I believe in God. Without saying I believe God can is an affront to the character of God. And as children of God, I don't want to live my life in the affront or the offense to the character of God. Your pastors are witnesses and testimonies that God came. Come on, give God praise. God, we love you. Thank you for the eternal truth of your word. Thank you for these moments. May we ever be reminded that we worship you, ah, the God that came. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God.